Namaskar, David. Welcome to Ahimsa Conversations. Thank you for making the time. Thank you for having me. No, it's a pleasure. Um, so, David, what would be your earliest recollection of uh, either the opposition to violence or uh, to any concept or experience of non-violence, maybe even from your childhood? I, uh, you cut out for a few words there, but my earliest recollection of opposition to violence. Um, huh, I, I, I don't know. I certainly didn't grow up uh, with peace activists or nonviolent direct action participants. Uh, I certainly learned about nonviolence uh, first, almost certainly uh, in the context of the US civil rights movement, uh, which had happened a decade or two or three uh, before I was born. Um, and I certainly remember uh, a profound uh, impact of seeing the, uh, the Hollywood movie about Gandhi uh, when I was a kid. Um, I also remember growing up in the context of absolutely normalized militarism, living near Washington, DC, having friends, parents, putting on military uniforms to, to go to work every day, militarism being all around us, uh, other kids' parents working for the CIA. Um, and I remember uh, a, a cousin of mine coming to visit from, a thousand miles away, another part of the United States, uh, and going, taking him to visit the United States Naval Academy, uh, which he wanted to attend. Uh, he wanted to be a good American militarist. Uh, and I remember the beautiful sunny day in Annapolis, Maryland, with the sailboats and people out having lunch and coffee and, uh, and this, you know, enormous permanent uh, institution for training people to murder. And I, I became, I had to lie down. Um, and, uh, I, I, I don't remember anybody telling me, Hey, you could work for peace. You know, there were no advertisements. How there old no would you be at that time? Do you recall how old you were? I think I must've been around, 12, 13. That's very young 14. to have such an intense experience. Well, unfortunately, a lot of children have the actual experience of war. I just don't. Uh, I, I grew up yeah. with the experience of all these distant wars that were vaguely talked about once in a while. Yeah. So how, as a grown up, how did you get drawn to the peace movement and to the anti-war movement? What, what brought you here? Well, I tried to work other jobs. I tried to work as a newspaper reporter uh, and I just couldn't stand the editing. Uh, I'm not good at taking direction, uh, especially when I disagree with it morally and I'm trying to make the world a better place and somebody's editing my articles. Um, I, I don't take direction well at all. You'll probably tell me to do something during this call and I won't do it. Uh, and uh, and so I finally found work as an activist, but on domestic issues, on poverty and racism and housing uh, and so forth. Uh, and I quit that to work on a presidential election campaign as the press secretary for a candidate named Dennis Kucinich, who was very much uh, against war. This was in 2004. Uh, and once I once we lost and he wasn't elected and I needed a new job, uh, I, I took a few other jobs, but uh, eventually I found my way to working for organizations on on peace, uh, which, you know, you have to you have to discover and then you have to get one of the few jobs that there are because you know, again, there's no recruitment campaign, there's no mass industry employing peace activists. Yeah, yeah. And then you went on to write a book called War is a Lie. Can you, can you just briefly uh, share what that book is about? And uh, in what yeah. ways is war a lie? Because uh, you know, many people's first reaction will be, my gosh, it's such a reality as we speak, 
there are people being killed so in what ways everybody will agree that it's wrong but in what ways is war a lie yes this was one of the first book obviously it was not a claim that war doesn't exist it was a book about thousands of different wars uh but it was a claim that just about every important thing we think about wars is not true uh okay. people uh, in, people in 2022 at least in the united states and in a lot of countries i've been to tend to think of war in 18th or 19th century terms they think that war kills primarily soldiers and participants in war whereas war kills primarily civilians they think that war is sort of a contest between two teams with different uniforms in a place called a battlefield, whereas wars take place primarily in people's cities and villages. Uh, they think that war is somewhat even handed. The casualties are 50 50 or 60 40, whereas most wars, the casualties are over 90 percent on one side. Uh, they think that that wars happen between countries of relatively equal wealth and power, uh, and they don't. They think that wars happen in violent regions of the world because of their backwardness, their culture, their skin color, their religion, uh, whereas, uh, in fact, the places that we think of as violent manufacture virtually no weapons of war. And the places that we think of as peaceful and enlightened and civilized export almost all the weapons to the places that suffer from them with the occasional exception of a war in Europe as <laughs> happening right now. Um, and, and the justifications that are given for every war that it's defensive, that it's necessary, that it's humanitarian, that they're all lies. Um, and the notion that somehow war is normal and we have to struggle for peace is a fundamental lie. That every getting every war started takes a long, concerted, diligent effort to avoid peace and get yeah. the war started. So I mean, I could go on. There are just yeah. thousands yeah. of lies. There's nothing true. Yeah. So, David, the most common, I think, counter to what you said would be Hitler. You know, a lot of people will say that they would like to agree, they agree with you. And yet they will ask, well, then if the allies had not gone in and fought Hitler, uh, would we not all be living in a Nazi world now? Uh, how would you respond to that? Well, the reason I wrote a book called Leaving World War II Behind uh, was because I, my tolerance for answering the same dumb question thousands and thousands of times at some point reaches a limit. And because I could state the argument most clearly and comprehensively with every footnote uh, and try to make it persuasive. So I will try my darndest, but I recommend to that teeny little fraction of humanity that reads books that you read the book leaving world war ii behind uh but obviously when you turn back the clock and imagine a different history uh there's a choice made of what instant to turn it back to uh and if you turn it back prior to world war one you don't do all the stupid things universally acknowledged by every peace activist and warmonger and, and anyone in between that started World War I. You don't end World War, if you turn it back to the end of World War I, you don't end it with a barbaric treaty that wise people on the spot predicted would launch World War II almost down to the day that it did launch World War II. If you turn it back to somewhere in the interwar period between the two world wars that we think of as separate, you don't do all the supporting by Western governments and corporations of Nazism in Germany as preferable to communism. You don't build up the, the Nazi war machine that top Nazis said could never have been done without the absolutely critical support of US corporations. Uh, if, you, if you turn it back to 
to post World War II, you don't invent the ahistorical post war justification that most people imagine today justifies World War II, right? In the lead up to and during World War II, there were public conferences of all the major governments of the world openly refusing to accept Jews or anyone else targeted by the Nazis in Germany for openly shameless anti-Semitic reasons, didn't want them. Uh, and peace activists went to the US and British governments all during the war and said, take the Jews and the others who are threatened out of Germany. Uh, and they were routinely told, we can't be bothered, we have a war, that's more important. But privately, the discussion was, my God, Hitler would go along with that. And what an inconvenience and what an embarrassment to all our allies who don't want these people. Uh, and I, I mention all of this because it, it, it not only when you say let's abolish war, do people scream Hitler? But when you ask why, they scream Holocaust. Uh, and so it's worth knowing that this has absolutely nothing to do with actual human history. There were no posters, Uncle Sam wants you to save the Jews. Never happened, right? Doesn't exist. But if you turn the clock back to that very instant of World War II starting in Europe, uh, or a little bit prior, World War II starting in Asia, or World War II starting with the United States, which was after those two events, what, well, my God, what do you do? Well, we have now not just the understanding of what, of what nuclear weapons mean so that we, we do anything possible to avoid that, uh, but we have an understanding of nonviolent resistance and how powerful it is uh, and how much greater it is as a strategy uh, in terms of success, not in terms of the purity of my heart and not dirtying my hands, but purely in terms of success as a tactic, nonviolent resistance, as we're seeing now in Ukraine, in combination with violent resistance, is more powerful, more likely to succeed. Uh, and of course, if you go back to World War II, uh, the very worst thing that humanity has ever done to itself in any short period of time, uh, if, you know, if you're going to use that to justify anything, you have to tell me some alternative scenario that would have been worse than the very worst thing that's ever happened. So, I mean, there's a, just to begin to scratch the surface of the response to the endless uh, Hitler question. So, David, how did your work with the world beyond war begin? I guess by creating World Beyond War, um, which I did with a handful of other people around 2014, I believe. Uh, and, and so this is, uh, what, seven years later, um, David Hartso, a wonderful longtime peace activist, uh, and I were the co-founders. Uh, and we had a number of people contribute ideas, and we started the thing up. David has been as part of Ahimsa Conversations. So could you- Terrific. Briefly, yeah, yeah, a, a long time, many months ago. Could you briefly describe the mission of uh, World Beyond War and how, what is your methodology in this group? Uh, the idea was, and, and we have followed through on it, was to create something that would do both nonviolent direct activism and education. Uh, so we do, protests and put ourselves in front of shipments of weapons uh, and work with local governments to divest funding from weapons companies uh, and, uh, you know, every kind of lobbying and agitating and protesting and demonstrating and interfering. And we do books and online courses and webinars and videos and training materials uh, and education of, of all sorts. Uh, in recent months, much of it's online, just like this. Uh, and it was created to be something global, to have board members and staff members and, and participants from all over the world, uh, which it uh, now does. Uh, and it was created to 
go after the whole institution of war, not just a particular war or a particular side of a war, a particular weapon, but war, uh, uh, the entire institution, because we looked at militaries uh, and how a tiny fraction of the spending, the money spent on militaries, could end starvation on earth, could end the lack of clean drinking water on earth, could create a serious attempt to slow down the, the, the ecological catastrophe uh, that's upon us. We looked at nuclear weapons, which threatened to destroy us all more swiftly, and how they could be abolished with if we abolished the institution of war. We looked at the impact on the rule of law, on racism and bigotry, on uh, you know every aspect of culture and and institutions that that war impacts. And it's you know very clear that keeping the militaries around is counterproductive. Where you build the bases, you get more wars. Where you send the weapons, you get more wars. Uh, but also does more, does more damage just in the diversion of resources and, and what it does to justify government secrecy and what it does to prevent governments cooperating on environmental catastrophes, disease pandemics, et cetera. So it's, it's not just a particular war. So in these rare moments when a war is in the news uh, and in the news in a new way, where the, where the big news organizations seem to actually care about the war victims because they're white or because it's a Russian war for whatever reason, uh, you know, this is an opportunity for us to say, what about all the war victims? What if we treated Iraqis and Afghans and Pakistanis and Somalis and, and Libyans as if they were Ukrainians? Uh, what about the whole institution of war that got us into this particular war? Uh, you know, so that's that was and is the idea uh, was to take it beyond ordinary peace activism and and advance the the agenda of war abolition. And uh, how does this activism contend with the reality that in human beings there is a will to power? And there are always, uh, you know, power conflicts uh, uh, that we see even, say, at a much lesser level. So, in a sense, I'm requesting you to elaborate on two different dimensions. One is the will to power, which is a part of human existence, but as much as nonviolence is. That is Gandhi's great insight, right? That nonviolence is as much a natural impulse as the will to power, that's one dimension. And the other is the sheer greed and the, you know, the fact that in modern times, more than perhaps ever before, companies benefit from war. Well, you're absolutely right that these are problems. Uh, one way to address them uh, is to show people examples. Uh, if you look at the prehistory of, of the human species at you know, the vast majority of the existence of modern homo sapiens on the planet, there's nothing resembling war. If you even look at war 100 years ago, it doesn't resemble current war. But if you go back thousands of years, there's nothing. And if you look at recorded history of the past five to 10,000 years, uh, war is quite sporadic. Uh, people will scream and shout that there's always been a war somewhere. Yes, but there's always not been a war. Many, many, many somewheres. Uh, and many places have gone without war for centuries. Uh, many places have not known what war was. You have anthropologists visiting tribes in Malaysia and trying to explain what war is, what murder is, what rape is, and having zero comprehension. What do you mean? How could that be? We would never do that, right? And these are these are human beings, exactly like any other human being. If if the United States government, which you know misrepresents four percent of humanity, were to take even a little step in the direction 
of the governments representing 96% of humanity, we would be well on the way to abolishing war. We would have a reverse arms race. There isn't any other government closer to US military spending than it is to zero military spending, right? Nobody, nobody approaches half of US military spending. And so when I hear people in the United States say, but, but it's human nature, it's inhumanity, I say, which humanity? You know, why does this 4% of humanity get to be humanity? Who, what are, what are all the other people, you know? And so, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's hard for people to avoid phrases like human nature and in, in our humanness and so forth. Uh, but, but 99% of the time, these phrases are excuses, they're excuses for not ceasing to do something that you don't want to cease doing. Uh, you know, we were always told that slavery was human nature, uh, that the oppression of women was human nature, that that all kinds of things uh, that have been abolished or at least made illicit and questionable were human nature. But there was never, nobody has ever once nature you know it can't it doesn't exist uh, and so we have to question what what we're obliged to do and recognize our responsibility to choose what we do uh, and there are societies with radically less greed than other societies individuals with radically less greed than other individuals uh, and you know they're all they're all equally human you know, and it's up to us to choose what we want to be. I think the uh, the reason for anxiety and despair is because there is a feeling that the institutions of the powerful nations of the world are controlled by people who uh, are driven by greed and by the will to power. That I think is the reason. So, for example, the you know this very evocative picture that has come out of Ukraine of a man kneeling in front of a tank. You know, that gives rise to two opposite responses. Some of us admire that man's courage and his active nonviolence. And then there are those who say, see, this shows how powerless nonviolence is. So how would you challenge that? Well, there are dozens of examples now of nonviolent resistance stopping oppression, stopping invasions, stopping occupations, reversing coups in a matter of days. Uh, and the success rate uh, is dramatically higher than the success rate for principally violent campaigns to resist oppression, occupations, et cetera. Both can fail. Both approaches fail all the time. There's no guarantee of success. Uh, but there is a, a greater likelihood of success with nonviolent approaches, and that could be built on. It could be an even greater likelihood of success if it were properly pursued. I mean, if, if either Russia or the United States had not spent the past 20 or 30 years trying to win over Ukraine to its side, but had spent that time educating Ukrainians on nonviolent non-cooperation in organized strategic fashion, Ukraine would be absolutely unoccupiable, right? I mean, already with nothing but militarism pushed from all sides, you know, from within and from outside Ukraine, nothing but militarism, militarism, you still have people kneeling before tanks, standing before tanks, walking tanks back, talking people out of tanks, talking soldiers out of war, feeding soldiers and having them phone their mothers and say they want to come home, uh, changing street signs, blocking roads, walking soldiers out of public plazas. Uh, if you can have this happening and have it squeaking through the cracks into media coverage outside Ukraine and have it praised by the president of the United States rather unwittingly, uh, you know, remarking on, uh, you know, on the, the nonviolent power in Ukraine in his in Joe Biden's State of the Union address. Uh, you know, this is this is remarkable. Imagine what could be done uh, 
if the United States were putting billions of dollars into nonviolent activist education rather than into coups on behalf of, of anti-Russian governments. Yeah. Well, you do have a base. I mean, World Beyond War does have some people on the ground in Ukraine. Am I right? Yes, we have people. Is there anything? Signed our declaration of peace and take part in some things. We have people in virtually every corner of the world. We have a board member who's who's based in Kiev, who's who's reporting from there uh, regularly now. Okay. Is there anything from their experiences that you would like to briefly share here? Well, I, I think uh, that the wisdom that we're getting from, from Yuri Shelyazenko, who's our board member in Kiev, uh, is that we need to keep opposing war, especially when there is a war, and keep opposing both sides of every war uh, and not fall for the propaganda of either side, uh, which does not mean the idiotic idea that that all sides are exactly equal in guilt and responsibility. It just means that there is some blame for all sides and we should not be supporting militarism from any side. We have so many people around the world saying, I oppose all war except for this one, you know, and saying that in support of, of both sides, some of them, the, <laughs> the, the Ukrainian side, some of them, the Russian side, right? Uh, and. Uh, and this is what we have to get away from. I oppose all war except this one. Uh, you know, war is horrible. There's always going to be horrors in war. There's always going to be uh, the, the need for people to defend themselves by some means. Uh, but we know this when we try to abolish war. We can't be against war only in times of peace. This, this won't get us anywhere. Can we take another five minutes? Is that okay? Sure. So what advice would you give to young people across the world or, or you know, what insights would you share uh, with young people who want to be part of this movement? And yet many of them sometimes wonder where can they start? You know, as individuals, they feel too small in the face of a gigantic uh, problem. Uh, so what are some of the uh, things that they could do at two levels. One is, I think, cultivating your own inner strength. What are some of the insights you could share on that? And the other, of course, is in organizing um, and, 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 you know, creating institutional structures that will enable us to form collectives around these values. Yeah, well, I mean, that there was uh, the... U.S. philosopher, psychologist, author William James over 100 years ago who thought we needed a moral equivalent to war because we don't really want war, but it's such a wonderful thing in terms of courage and camaraderie and sacrifice and strength, and we need something to substitute for it. Well, you know, <laughs> Mohandas Gandhi, among others, had long since not only substituted, but far surpassed war in terms of things you can do that are exciting, dangerous, involve teamwork and camaraderie, self-sacrifice, something greater than yourself, uh, have impacts immediately as well as long term. Uh, if you think you have to join in an organized operation of mass murder in order to have those things, you know, start looking around at the famines and floods and hurricanes that are coming. Start looking at the non-optional emergencies that we have to deal with uh, while militaries are busy creating these optional emergencies that we shouldn't be creating. Uh, and if you, so you can join in peace violent peace force and go as an unarmed civilian protector to places you're needed and have a much higher success rate than the armed UN so-called peacekeepers. Uh, and you can have all the risk and all the glory and all the camaraderie and brotherhood and sisterhood you could possibly dream of while actually doing the world good rather than harm. And you, don't, and you don't have to switch to being, you know, a veteran for peace and finding the camaraderie in denouncing all the harm you did. You know, you don't have to have that miserable regret and moral injury. You can go straight 
to doing good for the world. Uh, and when you do it with local groups and global groups and compiling our skills and our tactics, you can have victories very quickly, as well as building toward the ultimate victory, if we get there, of abolishing war. Yeah. Um, David, on the whole, are you hopeful? When you look, say, 50 years in the future, I'm not going to say the end of the century. Uh, and I know that the biggest question mark over the next 50 years is actually climate chaos uh, and all the associated, uh, uh, as you said, uh, avoidable, but now looking increasingly unavoidable sufferings. Uh, but in terms of just physical armament based war, how hopeful or despairing are you about the next 50 years? Uh, do you see world beyond war becoming a truly mass movement on a global scale? Well, in terms of predictions, uh, you know, we may already be past the, the, the tipping point. In we may not be able to collapse, uh, you know, life may already be doomed, uh, but it's possible it's not. Uh, in terms of nuclear apocalypse, the risk is higher than it's ever been, uh, and the awareness and concern surrounding it is lower than it's ever been. So that's not a good situation to be in. Now, it's perfectly possible that we dramatically change the, the behaviors of our governments and our major institutions and we go after protecting the environment and we go after abolishing war and the weapons that come with it, absolutely possible. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that my guessing or putting a percentage on the likelihood is that helpful. I do know that absolutely guaranteed my personal sensations of optimism or pessimism are completely irrelevant uh, and completely self-indulgent and not of any, any use to anybody. Well, no, I, I didn't mean that, uh, you know, you offer us a percentage uh, kind of a calculation. What I meant was what keeps you going? Because there's so much reason to despair that, you know, this mission is on an uphill uh, kind of, uh, or, or, you know, just running against the current. So yeah, what I, gives you the, you know, the confidence and the courage to continue this, uh, this, this uh, effort? Well, it doesn't take much courage. It really doesn't. Uh, and as long as there's a possibility of succeeding or of partially succeeding, we have a responsibility to do it. Uh, and I, I, I don't get any motivation or endurance from hope or despair. I really don't have any interest in either one. Uh, but in all those things I was talking about a minute ago, solidarity, camaraderie, teamwork, uh, sacrifice, uh, the, the, the joy that comes from the work, that's what makes me do the work. Uh, it's just far more enjoyable than sitting around doing nothing. It's that humans were made to be effective, to accomplish things, to do things, to try, to struggle. You have to imagine Sisyphus happy pushing the rock up the hill. Uh, people, people aren't happy watching TV or hiding under their beds uh, or, or, you know, despairing or blissfully ignoring things and hoping for the best. It, Pete, that doesn't make people have fulfilled lives. Uh, doing the work uh, gives you a fulfilled life. Thank you so much. I would love to talk more, but I think you have a very tight schedule. So I will show my appreciation for your making the time by letting you go. <laughs> Thank you very, very much.